Welcome back, everybody, to The Truth About Addiction. I have a very special guest today. He's a doctor of psychology, and he is not an addict, but he works very closely helping them. And I thought it was time to cast a wider net on the topic of addiction, because in my humble opinion, all of us are suffering to some extent from emotional addictions, if not physical ones. And if we're not, if we're that lucky, we certainly know and often love people who are. Check out this man's bio. Dr. Lockwood is a licensed psychologist working as an addiction treatment and recovery clinician since 2009. He earned his BA in psychology at the University of Missouri, Columbia and received his Master of Arts and his Doctor of Psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, Los Angeles. He currently serves as the Chief Operations Officer at Oak Forest Recovery in Thousand Oaks, California, and is a visiting professor at California Lutheran University teaching future clinicians about clinical skills, addiction, and research analysis. He also has a podcast on YouTube about topics related to mental health, wellness, psychology, and neuroscience called the Psychology Checkup. Finally, Dr. Lockwood is the author of The Fear Problem, a book integrating the neuroscience and evolutionary psychology of our fear process to explain why we get triggered by politics and other hot topics. Stick around. It's a really intellectually stimulating conversation. So tell me what you need and tell me where you bleed and I will listen. I can listen. Oh, I will listen. Welcome back, everybody, to The Truth About Addiction. I am really excited about this conversation for a few reasons. One, I have a really smart man across from me who is a doctor of psychology, among other things, and who happens to be the partner to one of my very best friends, Ricky Rebel. And it's a chance for him and I to get to know each other more intimately. And it's a chance to share with all of you a different perspective on recovery because Dr. Lockwood is not an addict, but he works with and around them almost every day of his life. And I I feel deeply motivated to have a really big conversation in general about the principles of recovery and the fusion of a more trauma-informed approach to the 12 steps, coupled with just the therapeutic principles of psychology, because both of those things have been at the cornerstone of the recovery of my capital S self, if you will. And so the more people I can spread this message to, the better I feel. (laughs) So Dr. Lockwood, thank you for being here. I can't wait for what you have to say and for everybody to get to know you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hmm. I think a great starting point selfishly, and also for everybody, is to talk a little bit about where you came from. Because I do believe that it informed to some extent or to a large extent who you are today, the work that you do in the world, and why you're impassioned about it. So can you take us back to your younger years? Sure. So... I would say my childhood has a lot to do with how I got into this business. Um, I grew up in a family of shrinks 
and uh, therapists and, and even a priest, uh, one of the only married priests on the planet. And so I have uh, a different vantage point than a lot of people who go into this profession with no personal or lived experience. So I grew up in the Midwest and in the South. I spent time in Southern Missouri and a little bit of time in Arkansas because my mom's family lived there for a period while I was a kid. And so kind of growing up in the South and the Midwest definitely shaped the way I see things like community, shaped things like um, hospitality, uh, a lot of culture. And, you know, I grew up in a very small town most of my life called Festus, Missouri, which was tiny. It was a few thousand people, maybe 10 at the most. And, uh, you know, the two big things in town were the churches and the PPG, Pittsburgh Plate Glass Bottling Plant. They made beer bottles, basically, for Anheuser-Busch, which is located in St. Louis, north of it. And so, you know, a lot of people drank and went to the bar and a lot of people went to church. Those are two big influences on my life as a kid. Now, my parents had nothing to do with a small town of Festus, Missouri, other than they wanted to find a house that was cheap, so they moved outside of the city, having spent most of their life in St. Louis as adults. So my mom was a nurse, and then she became a secretary at a big um, Lutheran church organization for most of her life. She's now retired. And then my father is a, a therapist who is also sober. And he was sober before I was even born. I think he's been sober or something like 47 years, if I'm not mistaken. And so before I even knew what sobriety was, he was on the journey. And so I think I remember my first AA experience with him probably around the age of eight. And I remember, you know, being around, going to a meeting, hearing people say the serenity prayer and all these things, which made zero sense to me at the time, because I thought, well, we already go to church. What's this about? Right. And so, you know, as I got older, I began to learn more. I began to pay attention to habits my dad had, like reading the 12 and 12 at the kitchen table in the morning and, you know, all these things. And, you know, I spent most of my life with my dad uh, when we had like alone time. We were typically in the car going up to St. Louis because that's where his office was, his private practice is currently to this day. And so we kind of did a lot of driving. We spent, you know, multiple hours on the road on the weekends, sometimes on Fridays. And, you know, I would hear him talk to his sponsees for all of my childhood, basically, and talk to a sponsor occasionally. And he would read them the right act and ask them, like, why they're acting in self-will, and you know, why they're in fear. And, you know, he'd do 10 steps with people and all these things that, you know, I had some very, very minimal understanding of as a kid and as a teenager. And then as I got older, I started to realize that this was serious in the sense that like these were principles that really, really mattered. The other part of my life as a kid is I grew up very religious, right? And so I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church in my town. And, you know, it was overall a great experience because I had probably one of the most loving pastors you could ever want. His name was Dr. Richard Adams. And so, you know, it was very much a New Testament focused church, even when we talked about the Old Testament. And it was very much like love and redemption, not fire and brimstone for most of my life. And so I never once really experienced all those like stereotypically bad things that people talk about with religion, that, like the shame and the guilt and the you're going to hell and what's wrong with you and trying to preach at people to convert them. And, you know, I just, I had a relatively, I'd say good experience, lucky uh, experience that a lot of people don't have with religion growing up. And so those were pretty big influences on my life. And so as a little kid who knew nothing about the world and having these major forces in my life started to, let's say, craft and shape the way that I see the world. So I, I started to see the world through, you know, essentially uh, principled terms. The principles matter before anything else because there's this phrase, right, in AA, which is like principles before personalities, which I don't know how frequently and thoughtfully people enact that phrase, but, they, you know, it's there. And so, and again, I don't, even, I don't even know how frequently and thoughtfully my dad enacted that phrase, but, you know. I will say that, you know, I had this, this experience of hearing all about principles, like reading Proverbs every day as a kid and, and Pilgrim's Progress and all these things. And so on the one hand, there's like my public self, which is 
principles, Boy Scout, Eagle Scout, do the right thing, be kind, be nice. I was one of the happiest people. I was always smiling. And then on the other hand, there's this, this private self that was developing that I think is true for a lot of people in not just homes where one parent is in recovery or should be in recovery, but also most homes uh, where I had no clue what was happening, right? Like there was this world that was developing around me as I got older that made no sense to me. It actually, it made less and less sense to me as I got older, as I started to go from like elementary school to middle school to high school, as things became socially more complex, I became radically more lost because, Mm -hmm. you know, when I was very young, I'd say even back to like five, I had no understanding of why people liked me or why I was supposed to like people, right? I remember being in kindergarten going, okay, I'm forced to be here. Cause like for me, my ideal life, I think at like five is being able to like walk around the little, you know, backyard, three acre backyard we had and like discover rocks or like figure things out because like rocks and things and how things worked were way more interesting to me than people. I'm very much a thing oriented person, which is kind of fascinating given that I'm a psychologist. Uh-huh. To me, to me <laughs> people are people are more like things and they became things when I was very young, right? Um, because that was the only framework that worked for me as a kid. So I remember being in kindergarten doing all these social things like going to the playground and things like that, going, I don't know why I'm here, right? This is school. I'm supposed to be learning something, right? And so learning social skills didn't even seem like a topic that could be possible as a kid. I just thought I had to be here. These are people I had to be around. And then as I started to grow a little bit and develop a little more social nuance, I realized that people wanted to do things to have fun with other people, which again, made zero sense to me as a person, because generally speaking, the way I am, my first instinct to this day, you know, 30 years later, literally speaking, is not text someone, call someone to have fun, right? Like just my current life, if I could like have my dream, there would be a studio somewhere with a grand piano in it that I could play by myself and I could escape to. That is my dream. My dream is not. (laughs) You and my husband would get along really well. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like my dream is not have a bunch of people to talk to me all day you know what i mean my dream is not like go have go on a trip to italy with my friends like that is not my dream that is other people's dream and that's fine my dream is like there is this quiet studio with a piano and like a chair that i can read books in and that will be marvelous right and i'm i'm working my way towards that dream but you know we're getting there but genuinely speaking as a kid that was also my dream when we got a piano as a kid i was the happiest person because now i had something that was mine to be creative, but also was just for me, Mm -hmm. right? And there was no real expectation other than like I was taking piano lessons, so I had to do like a recital once a year. But like, other than that recital, the expectation was I learned so that I can have fun and do something that kind of brings me joy as a person. And so whether it was like collecting rocks or playing the piano, these were solitary things. I wasn't collecting rocks and trying to figure things out because I wanted to show people right? I was interested in these things because they were purely just fascinating, right? Why do these different layers of sediment show up the way that they show up? How does a geode form, right? These are fascinating questions. I always joke with some of my psychologist friends, if I could go back to school, I would go back and be a geologist. I would just go back and get a PhD in geology and just like go study something, you know, just the first thing that takes my fancy, but I don't think that's going to happen. So um, as a little kid, people made no sense to me. Social obligations made even less sense other than the fact that I knew that I had to in order for people to not ask me what was wrong. Because what started to happen as I got older is I had my parents and sometimes teachers go, are you okay? And I'm like, I think I'm fine, actually. What's, what's, what's the problem here, right? Like I remember that 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 this is a story I tell all the time to people to explain why I think I'm a little different. I remember being in kindergarten and having this conversation with my mom where it's like your friend, Derek, who I didn't know why he was my friend. Honestly, I knew that I liked him because he was nice to me, but that's all I knew. I just knew that he was nice to me. That's it. I didn't know anything about his personality. 
I didn't really know who he was. I knew his dad like had a, he worked for a gas company and he sharpened knives on the side to make cash. Right. But like, I didn't know anything else about his, his family. And so it was Halloween and I was supposed to go trick or treat with Derek because that's what people do. That's what kids do. And I was like, I don't want to go. But she's like, don't you want to hang out with your friend? I'm like, I don't think so. I think were my exact words or something like that. And like, I remember just vividly, there's a picture of me somewhere, like six-year-old me in a firefighter's outfit, cheap plastic vinyl firefighter's jacket and crappy plastic hat with Derek next to me. And he's smiling and I'm like sort of smiling. And you know me well enough to know what my sort of smile looks like, right? <laughs> and so that is the, I think I'm supposed to smile. Smile, it is not the, uh, like I'm genuinely happy experience. And so this, this is one of many experiences in my life where it's like, go do this thing because that's what's expected of you. Another great example is like, they, they, gave, they got me like a, I think it was middle school and I had amassed a few more friends because I knew if I didn't, people would ask questions. So to not have people asking me questions, I started to be friendly with other folks in middle school that I kind of knew from elementary school. And once upon a time, they threw me a, a bowling alley birthday party and like there's no person who knows me now who would think patrick loves bowling <laughs> let alone the younger version of me you know but for some reason my parents in their infinite wisdom were like you know what let's 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 put patrick in the loudest noisiest experience with a bunch of people that he's like friendly with and is not upset at being around, but like has no real intrinsic motivation to be around other than I have to have these people to get through this experience. Right. Was my experience as a kid. And that's all coupled with the fact that I didn't really understand why relationships mattered in general whether it was with my family or with my friends you know none of it made any sense to me even the very 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 nice people at church who treated me very very nicely you you could have asked me if you caught me in a moment where i could actually tell the truth and not like put on the i'm being polite thing as a kid there was no moment where i was like i really like so and so as a kid even the super nice people at church mm. I was never like, I can't wait to go see, right? It's never happened in my life. And so genuinely speaking, I was just torn. And so something else I think about as I've gotten older is like, what are the other, let's say, signs or symptoms that something up, something was up, right? So one of my uh, saddest memories, I think, as a kid uh, was I was in Boy Scouts and I think we were selling popcorn or something. It's one of our standard sales to make money. And we we sold the most in our troop or whatever. So we got like a reward as a troop. And it was like tickets to go see a blues game, St. Louis Blues hockey team. And so there's this hockey uh, arena called the Keel Center, which used to exist, but it no longer does. And it was like all concrete and steel. And it's the loudest, most echoey thing on the planet. And some arenas are that way, some arenas are not. This one was like old school, a giant fishbowl, super echoey and loud. And at the time I was like, I was Cub Scouts, I was probably like, I don't know, like 10 or 11 or something. But I remember going to this and, you know, the whole troop is there, all this stuff, right? It's a social thing. I'm in Scouts against my will, but I do it because it's the right thing to do, right? but it's a social thing. They keep trying to socialize me. That's the moral of the story. And I have no clue why. And so we, we walk into the arena onto like the mezzanine or whatever that entry level is. And I remember how loud it was and it just being very like unnerving is the word I can come up with an adult. As a kid, I was just hyper stimulated. And then the free first period warm up buzzer rings after we're all seated. And it's like nosebleed seats because, it's you know, you're not getting nice seats just because you win some popcorn thing. And that buzzer was so loud that I immediately collapsed and started crying. And I didn't even know why. 
like first time in my life ever having a, an intense reaction to sound mm. at like 10 or something. And that was sign number one, something might be a little different about Patrick, right? Other than the whole, like, why the hell do people matter thing? Sign number two, other than years that. later, other than that, <laughs> other than that little thing. At the time, I was just, everyone's this way. Sign number two is uh, years later uh, for, I think it's my birthday, but I can't recall. The, my parents knew I was interested in vehicles, cars, trucks, mechanical things, but especially cars. And there was one truck I liked called Gravedigger. And it's cool. It's green. It's black, whatever. I think that was the extent of it. Like, I didn't really know anything about the horsepower of the engine or whatever at the age of like 12 or 13. But like, it was back at the Keel Center. So we're going back to this echoey, loud thing. Because, like, when you watch monster trucks on TV, you have volume control. And so you're not going to freak out or anything because you don't, you're not overwhelmed. So they they did the nice thing. They took me to go see the monster trucks. And, I mean, like, the moment we got inside the Kiel Center Arena into the inner, like, seating area. And all these, like, 12 trucks are revving their engines and shit. I just collapse again and start crying. And I don't know why. Like, it's like, it's like having a seizure essentially it just comes out of nowhere and so what was the response by the adults in the in those moments uh my dad was mostly just confused he's like are you okay did something happen mm. and they just let me go outside you know like during the scouts thing i couldn't just leave because we were all there together as a group and so i basically sat outside of a hockey game for most of the entire game it's a long time to sit outside while the vendors do their thing but for the monster truck by, by yourself um parts of it i was parts because they had to go back inside and check on the other kids but with the monster truck thing no we just went home because it was just it was not going to be a winning strategy to stay there it's a bad idea so between those experiences of like being so socially lost and then like having no tolerance for intense sound whatsoever apparently um the way I look at my childhood a lot is there was something different about me. I don't know if the word the kids use is neurodivergent or whatever, but like there was something different about me such that people were more like things. And uh, if I don't pay close attention, people will figure out that I'm not interested is kind of the moral of the story. Mm -hmm. And what that left me with was this acute sense of like, well, pay close attention you know, my dad being a shrink, family members being shrinks. I learned all these skills. I had some textbooks from his graduate psychology classes. I had all the, and I had all these biblical principles like at my disposal, right? That I could use to craft a structure for basically, you know, and it wasn't like Machiavellian or anything. I wasn't like this brilliant 12 year old. I was just like tossing shit together to make it work so that I could figure out how to deal with people. Right. So what I what I learned how to do was to step way back. Not only was I not interested, but then I actually started to take more steps back from people interpersonally. So that I could pay even more attention so that I could have an even better grasp of whatever I thought was happening. And then as a result of that, what I learned very quickly by like late middle school was I'm really good at noticing patterns, mm. like exquisitely good. And I'm good at noticing little patterns about clothing, hair, face, tone of voice, day to day, week to week. And so that became my most important task was to not be found out and to not get in trouble. Pay very, very close attention. Because like, listen, when people consistently ask you if you're OK, even though everything is basically fine, mm. it's very confusing and it's very disconcerting. Yep. And like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't want to have to perform for anyone. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to excel before you even get close to trying to ask me to do something for you. What a crafty kid. Yes. I became extremely crafty very quickly and it worked and it worked and it became so workable that it pushed me into um, psychology, I think. Because people were literally fascinating in the sense that, like, how does a carburetor work? Which is fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had a unique skill. 
And I had all these like years of reading like graduate psych textbooks, which gave me amazing ideas. I think I thought were amazing, right? Like the concept of defense mechanisms, which I learned at like 13, I think. The standard Freudian defense mechanisms. Fascinating. And then when you get to go practice it as a middle schooler and go see people project, see people, you know, use dichotomous thinking or, you know, suppress their feelings to go do whatever they want to do to get along socially, all these things, super fascinating. Mm. And so I wanted to go extend that experience in college and in graduate school because I felt like I had, to some degree, a unique experience. Now, having been around for a long time, I know that I'm not particularly unique. However, you know, to the extent that I am different, it does give me a slightly different perspective than the other folks that do this work who are, you know, more socially engaged, let's say. Hmm. God, that's so fascinating. I want to just ask something. Okay. About the neurodivergence, right? And so yeah. it's really interesting to me that your father was a psychologist. However, you know, there's way more information about spectrum disorders and neurodiversity now than there was. I don't even know if that was a thing. You'll probably know when you were growing up. No. Yeah. Where then in your personal journey of self-discovery, did you go, huh? I think there's the same way for me that having a problem with addiction and knowing mm. that that was a symptom and that yeah. there a ton of root causes underlying, did you have that sort of aha moment of, oh, the thing that others me that the reason in part I have felt so different from my peers is this thing that now actually has a name and a description. It's probably going back to, I would say maybe 20 or 21, something like that. Wow. That's a long time. Not. Yeah. Have- yeah. I mean like, because mm-hmm. like as I got older I started to talk shop with my dad a lot more and you know one of the the double-edged swords of my life is that my old man is also extremely insightful and so he often shared his insight with me about me and who I was and how I was growing up and you know one thing he shared with me was that you know I have this distance from people and he had some assumptions about what that was about, whether it was like attachment security or stuff with mom. And, you know, I, I thought about that a lot when I was younger. And then as I got older, I started to date, you know, my first female relationship was in high school. My first male relationship was in college and kind of a trend across all these early relationships to this day, obviously, is that Patrick is very disagreeable. Right. And so, you know, I started to realize there was a personality difference of some kind. Right. So now in modern personality types, we talk about agreeableness and extroversion and openness and conscientiousness and all that stuff. But, you know, as a kid and as a college student, I didn't really have any uh, sophisticated understanding of personality styles or traits or temperament. But I just knew that I was always rough around the edges. And it wasn't because I didn't like people or I was upset with people. It's just genuinely speaking my first approach to any situation is what is factually correct not what does make anyone feel good that is so secondary tertiary quaternary to me that it it doesn't even register most of the time right so the modern way we look at that is trade uh, trade agreeableness right so i score very low on trade agreeableness and always have and all of my romantic partners have told me since i've dated and Genuinely speaking, that difference became more and more clear as I got older, right? So 16, I realized I'm a little different with regard to both sexuality and personality. 20, first male relationship, he says, why are you such a dick all the time? Kind of really sticks out, you know? (laughs) I just had a mic drop. (laughs) Yeah, right? And, and, And like, 
and it, it, it even like even in therapy when i was in therapy for years mm. my therapist tried to explain to me that there's a difference between like attachment insecurity personality differences and trauma and depression and all these things she was very gentle and very open she never once told me what was true she just helped me explore as good therapists do right and so mm. kind of my understanding of how different i am has really evolved a lot since like 20. but i started to really understand that like i come from a family of narcissists and very disagreeable people extremely every every person i grew up with is a sparrer they love to spar they're better verbal debaters than like all the famous, you know, political commentators, you know what I mean? And they just didn't give a shit. And some of that spectrum stuff and some of that's personality stuff, you know? Mm. And so I put two and two together years ago and figured out, you know, this is probably the correct combination of things. <laughs> so fascinating. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Wow. So... I'm curious for a moment now. Yeah. There's a bunch of questions. And you, you might answer them without my interruption, but a few things. What was your impression of recovery since you were exposed really early? What was your understanding of it? What was your understanding of sort of the hard knocked way your dad was taking? his sponsees through the steps what was your feeling about god between what you heard in recovery as a kid and growing up in a christian home before we dive into the very real and and important thing you're you're talking about besides all that which is this feeling of otherness that I think in 12 step programs traditionally is seen very much as an addict's disposition and yep. stamp when yep. truly I think so 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 many of us on some level experience an othering I just don't belong here something is off here and it's a little different for all of us uh, and so I think it's really important that you're saying that and you're not someone who identifies as an addict and we will get sort of back around to that in a moment but just those early things I want to know a little more yeah, I can tell you all about my reactions to uh, my dad's approach to sponsoring, um, the other people I met in recovery as a kid and how they functioned. I think my general impression was that this was an accountability group. Hmm. And it was super important to be honest was the probably the main takeaway because the one thing maybe not the one thing, but maybe the most important thing I heard my entire childhood growing up in that home was how dishonesty tends to destroy lives. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's because I'm more disagreeable as a person or it's because I grew up in that home or both, it was very important to me to never lie. It was very important to me to listen to all the catastrophe that happens when people sugarcoat things, when people hold back what they're feeling or what their resentments are. I heard a lot about resentment as a kid and the selfishness of resentment in particular. And so because of all this, it left a mark on me that recovery is an accountability system that's based on some sense of God, right? I think I heard the word God more than anything, probably when I hung out with my dad in these situations. Mm -hmm. And it was, and, and God was used as sometimes a, um, a trump card, I guess you could say, in conversations, which makes a lot of objective on paper sense, but emotionally might have felt coercive to some people, I imagine. And then I think the other times I heard God referenced was with a sense of like, why do you have to control things? Mm. Why are you letting fear run your life? And where is God in your life? And that mentality was drilled into my brain. Mm. 
And I don't regret that at all. I think that's probably one of the best things that happened to me as a kid was the idea that if fear is in charge of my life, that I'm not like appropriately surrendered or having the, and from a more secular perspective and a more clinical psychology perspective, like what I learned was that if fear is in charge, that I'm not really fully acknowledging reality because reality is I'm never in charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, do you, to be how do you rectify those belief systems that were being pressed upon you and the Christian idea of God? How did you bridge that gap as a young boy, especially in the LGBTQ community? Yeah, I had the best luck. Mm -hmm. I really believe. Like the, the church that I grew up, First Baptist of Festus, was like, it's, it wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but I had the best versions of what's supposed to come out of people's mouths if they're really Christians, right? So a lot of people have negative stereotypes about Christianity because of like Westboro Baptists and hatred and fear and all that crap, which is it's real. And there are definitely pockets of Christianity all over the world and some places more than others where that happens. Um, Unfortunately for the people that think Christianity is all bad, it was my experience that I grew up with people who talked a lot about love, who talked a lot about um, not letting fear run your life in my church, right? And so I was actually getting kind of parallel messages, maybe with a slightly different tone from my dad, a little more fire and brimstone from my dad sometimes. But, you know, the pastor I grew up with, Dr. Richard Adams, was like one of the most gentle and calm and easy people to talk to. He never gave a sermon in all the years he was alive because he died when I was, I think, like 13 or 14. But like when he was the head of the church, I never heard him give a fire and brimstone speech or a fear-driven political speech or a you should hate, you should be afraid of, you should, like, it was never that. And he still talked about the Old Testament where a lot of those messages live, but he always reframed them from a New Testament kind of like, forgiveness, grace, love, compassion, perspective, mm -hmm. you know? And so because I grew up in that world, even when I came out, no one gave a shit in the sense that they, they never treated me differently. Mm -hmm. And no one ostracized me. No one tried to convert me. In fact, the only person that actually tried to convert me was my dad. But mm -hmm. that soon quit when I held uh, a very firm boundary with him about the way he was talking to me about that. But everyone else in church was absolutely phenomenal as a person. Like, you know, in the sense of like, they actually tried to embody the concept of grace and the concept of love and understanding and all these things that are talked about in the New Testament far more than the Old Testament. And so because of that, um, a lot of what I was learning in the recovery sense from my old man was mirrored in a often more gentler approach mm -hmm. at church. And so I didn't really see much of a discrepancy other than tone. So on that note, can you think of, and I'd love if there's something that pops up for that to be the example, the sort of what comes to mind from this question, so you're a, a young boy. Yeah. It, it could be anywhere from five to 15, let's say. Yeah. And you don't make a great choice. And now you're face to face with your dad, your, mm. your biggest accountability partner, mm. who's gonna let you have it, you know, and tell you uh, what he thinks about all that. What is that exchange like? It rarely ever happened because what I was excellent at doing because I was so busy like learning and observing and paying attention and calculating and predicting and all that stuff was I learned how to perform. So in all sincerity and in all honesty, I was a great kid. Everyone called me precocious and happy and thoughtful and conscientious, smart all these things. So from elementary school through 
most of high school, I would say, he never had to rebuke me to use a biblical word because for the most part, all I did was perform mm. and it performed excellently. You give me a task and I'll blow it out of the water, right? And that's true to me to this day. And so the, the only real challenging conversation we had was probably in probably in early high school, 15 or 16, maybe, maybe 15. Can't quite recall. But it was around the era of satellite internet when it was first a thing. And I think that was the first time I started exploring pornography. And in that experience of exploring pornography as a 15 year old, I looked at everything that interests me. And for those of you who don't know my partner, Ricky, or don't know, or haven't ever interacted with me, which is most people, I'm bisexual, so I was interested in both. And so uh, at one point, um, before there was really fancy ad blocking and pop-up blocking technology, I think they turned on the family computer one morning and saw some pop-up of a, like a gay porn thing. And so I got a conversation with him that night when he got home from seeing patients about it. And it was, it wasn't accusatory, but it was definitely intense in the sense of like, is something wrong? Mm -hmm. Are you having thoughts and feelings about this? And it was very much like talking to a therapist, but a therapist who had serious concern, not a therapist who was curious, mm -hmm. if that difference in tone makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so that was at the time, fairly shaming. And I lied through my teeth, even though he didn't believe me. And that was probably the first time in our entire relationship I actually lied to him directly. Other than that, like I remember the first time I drank, I drank at the age of 17, I think it was. And I told him because I knew he was sober, I knew his strong opinions about these things. And I had tons and tons of horror stories of what my old man's like when he's drunk mm -hmm. in my head. And so I was like, hey, I have my buddy, Sean. He wants me to come hang out on Friday night with all my friends from McDonald's where I used to work. I was a maintenance guy at McDonald's. And so I was like, I, I think they're going to drink there. Is that, does that bother you? And he's like, no, hmm. do what you want to do. Just be careful because you have my genes, right? So he was very like hmm. hands off in the sense of like, he didn't try to admonish me. He didn't try to rebuke me or, or, spit the fear of God into me. And uh, a similar story like that is graduation, high school graduation. So out in the country, there's two things you do when you graduate, you either have sex or you go to the fields and you get drunk all night with your friends, right? And so that's what we did. And or so, a lovely combination of both. Or a lovely combination of both. And so <laughs> in uh, this was the second time I drank uh, as I went to my, my 18 year old high school graduation party. And uh, I drank too much, admittedly, and I vomited, but I threw my keys, I don't know where, in the field, and I just slept in my truck. You know, and my dad was like, listen, you know, it's your choice to do this. Just know what's at risk if you do it, and please don't drive. Mm -hmm. You know, so for the most part, I never experienced his harshness directly in my life except for that instance I told you about. And I observed it though with my mom. I observed it with his sponsees and things like that. And, you know, he has since admitted that because of his trauma and things like that, he tended to react with more anger or brashness. And so he's softened a great deal in the last 20 years as our relationship has improved. But you know, he was in a great deal of fear. And so I experienced someone who was in recovery who was trying his best, but also in a fair amount of fear. Okay. Two parts now to the next question. One yeah. is, can you describe watching an interaction like that between your dad and your mom as a sure. kid? And clearly there's been quite a bit of learning and understanding now for you to sit across from me and be able to call what you did a performance. Mm -hmm. 
right now you know oh i i i was showing up in this way mm -hmm. because it was the way to keep the peace it is what i learned i needed to do right. essentially to stay in close connection to my caregivers, which is what we do with attachment, right? We, we navigate and we go, okay, this is the landscape in my home. And we don't want to ruffle the feathers of this person or this personality too much. So let me mold and shift and shape myself so that I stay in close communion with the people who are keeping me alive. Right. So, so I I'm interested also in when you saw as more of an adult, that what you were doing as a child was a performance. I knew it the entire time. Mm. Like I vividly, okay, as, a, as an easy example, um, and smiling at people while having no real connection to them, no real interest in them, and no real joy from the experience of being around them, and knowing that this was the perfect charade to make sure people liked you. Mm. And so it was not even about being at home because I had the good fortune of both of my parents working a great deal. Mm. And so at home, I, I, I got exactly what I wanted for the most part, which was I was left alone to explore the rocks because the rocks are fascinating to me or to play the piano as much as I wanted. Mm. I was never as a kid like, oh, I wish I could be closer to my mom or to my dad or to my sister. I was always like, oh, I can't wait to have more time to myself. Mm. You know, my sister was not a bad person. My parents were not bad people at all, but like, I was genuinely not interested. There was, and it wasn't because there weren't things in common. It was because like, people aren't what get me off, believe it or not. Like a car is far more fascinating to me than a person. A gem or a geode is far more fascinating to me than a person is. I happen to have a particular skill for understanding people and working with people, but you'd never catch me wandering around town hoping that I talk to somebody mm -hmm. and get to meet somebody new. But you can be sure as shit, when I go on a run, I'm always fascinated by the next rock that I'm about to see. Mm -hmm. That's way more interesting to me. And that's how I've always been. And so the performance was for everybody, not even remotely my parents, but it just happened to work on them too. So, um, but your first question was, uh, what was it like watching them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I observed a pretty classic dynamic, I think. Um, I would observe them at home at the dinner table at night when both of them are home from working a long day. And I think that they would be fine and catching up and all that stuff. And then at some point, one of the two of them would say something that would bring up insecurity in the other person. And one or both of them, typically both of them, would react with fear and anger. And so my reaction to that initially, I think, when I was younger was like, why? It's just not that big a deal. And then as I got older, I was like, you know, it's kind of exhausting that you can't handle your fucking feelings. Like, shouldn't you know better, both of you? You're both Christians. Where are your principles? Or in my dad's case, you're like, you're a therapist and you are in recovery. And so are is this the principal version of you that's that's reacting and, you know, arguing or being intense for no reason? Like, you know, so it started to feel more like hypocrisy when I got older, probably in adolescence. But when I was younger, I was more like confused. I was like, this is, and it was run of the mill stuff that obviously all couples argue about stupid shit as I do with Ricky. But, you know, when you're not paying close attention to your side of it, you're like, it's so easy to get off the handle for no reason. And I think I observed that not very frequently, but frequently enough where I was like, why, why are we in the same pattern after all this time having like, as the astute observer that I am, theoretically speaking, I'd be like, well, don't you just switch it around this way? So, that, you know, like, it seems so simple to me. You have insecurities about money, we'll deal with it differently. You have insecurities about who picks up who from school, like, why does that cause a feeling? It seems like such a simple logistical thing, you know? <laughs> that was what it was like for me as a kid. <laughs>
So fascinating because you also said that, and maybe this has changed, but that you don't, you didn't have an imagination, None. right? And so on the one hand, if the emotional canvas is limited inside of you, it's not a big part of who you are and it's much more about logic and reason and, yeah. you know, you're very cerebral in how you navigate things. And yet, which is jumping ahead, but, but still you're a doctor of physical therapy. I mean, I'm a doctor of physical, you're a doctor of psychology and, yeah. and all you do all day is handle someone else's often very messy emotional canvas. So yeah. now I'm sure the clinician in you and the very rational thinker in you and the the one who puts the puzzle pieces together because you've been such an astute observer is so good at maybe talking somebody off the emotional ledge and kind of gathering them back up so they're more regulated and they can kind of think through the situation, not from a fear-based place. And at the same time, haven't you had to imagine to be a good clinician, their pain? Have you, have you imagined, have you tried to imagine with people who show up with horrific trauma and, you know, tales to tell? Well, if, if that happened and I imagined it happening and it might feel like that, how do I take what I'm going to reason them through from that place, as opposed to somebody's baseline being neutral, emotionally neutral. And now I'm going to take you through steps A, B, C, D, E of how to be accountable, how to make it right, how to change course, because that's one thing. But when you're dealing with, and someone who's speaking from personal experience, right? I'm an addict. I'm going to be 15 years sober next month. My natural disposition is I'm a hardwired perfectionist. I tumble into a shame spiral immediately, yeah. if not course corrected, Yeah. right? Left to my own devices. My internal critic will lacerate me. Yeah. And so, so somebody like me who comes in to your office and that's my baseline, how would I fare? with a guy like you, unless you met me there in that space? I think it depends. You know, I've worked with a lot of folks who have a great deal of trauma and I've had hit and miss experiences. I think some of the experiences that have hit that have gone well include moments where um, like, and maybe this is a tangent, so you can tell me to stop, right? Uh, and this is something I only learned about like eight years ago. So this is, you know, not, not something I thought um, was like a profound insight on my part or something. It's like, it's something that I thought might be true. And then I've, I've read some papers that kind of confirm that it's, it's the truth. And so there's this interesting set of research that's been done on therapy and treatment. And one of the variables that they look for, right, when they look at like, you know, treatment specific. So what modality are you using? Are you CBT or EMDR, or whatever it is, right? And so they look at kind of like the, the specific factors is what it's called. And they look at common factors, right? And so in the common factors world, um, you know, the number one variable that predicts whether or not therapy works, whether it's at rehab or, you know, just going to see your therapist once a week is the quality of the therapeutic relationship. That has been the best predictor of whether or not someone gets anything out of therapy, whether it's for 15 sessions, 60 sessions, or longer. And it doesn't matter what modality you use. In fact, the quality of the therapeutic relationship is the best predictor for the last 40 years, and it always has been. And it, that's for the obvious reason that we're people and we heal by you know, feeling connected, right? So your question is fundamentally, how can you connect with someone who has such a different set of experiences? And so I think the challenge that I overcome with my particular limitations, they're not the patients, they're my limitations, 
is finding a way to articulate what I believe I see in a way that's not off-putting. Mm. People can understand where I'm coming from. Because in some moments, I have the correct attitude that helps the person feel disarmed, right? And so I know for a fact that I have the ability to show up in a way that sounds and feels, most importantly, curious. And curious without any intention. I also have the ability to be curious in a very pointed way, to have like a clipboard out mentally, mm -hmm. right? And so what tends to work, as you might imagine, is when I'm curious without the clipboard, right? Because if I'm being pointed, if I have a goal, if I have like somewhere I have to get, and it's about me, number one, and not about them, so that's selfish. And number two, that means I know what's best. Mm. And I think that's crap. My textbook knowledge is great and it makes me a great professor, I think. But I don't think it does shit for my clinical life. I think what patients tend to value about me, generally speaking, is the desire to just be myself and to not hide and to not make it about me in particular. That's the, that's the interesting space that people get when they see me for clinical work, whether it's individual therapy or family therapy. And it's actually a very disarming experience because I might come off a certain type of way if you see me at the gym, in the waiting room, uh, when you first meet me, but then when you sit across from me and like, there's really nothing there, then it's really just about you. Now that can be kind of scary because again, like you said, people with a lot of trauma might expect to be held. They might expect that, you know, are you appropriately engaged? Are you really present? But the truth is I am because the moment you say something and I reflect what I think I hear or I have, um, you know, some kind of validating or affirming statement, you quickly realize that I'm paying extremely close attention. And not only am I paying attention, but I really understand where you're at, right? So my goal is always to help people feel understood mm. when I do this work. Now, that doesn't mean I'm always someone's cup of tea. And it's very clear when someone's not, and so I don't work with them, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So then I have more questions so many questions um did you have to work at being that kind of clinician who stays curious without the clipboard i think in graduate school when i was training it was a lot of work because my expectations were very skewed what were they uh they were that if you if you don't authoritatively know exactly what to do mm. like a physician would right then you're probably not going to be able to help the person and i became very quickly disillusioned about that as i started to see people in graduate school and then i had this wonderful experience which you know i don't want to take up too much time with it but i had a mentor named john daly who was just this brilliant lovely person in recovery who unfortunately has died, but, um, you know, he taught me a lot when he was supervising me because the thing that he taught me to do was to uh, live by the principles that I learned as a kid from recovery, which was to do the right thing and let go of the outcome. And so when John and I would sit for supervision, he was a brilliant person, he was smart as well. We could spar if we wanted to, but we never did the entire time we were friends and he was my supervisor. Because all he perceived that I needed was someone to have space, as a good clinician would. And so that's what he taught me to do, is just create space for people. Mm -hmm. And he taught me to do the right thing, which was to never make it about me and what I think I need. Mm -hmm. And that was great. And it changed me forever, literally, to this day. I want to, I want to share something that I heard. 
I want to know your take on it. I listen to podcasts all the time. And uh, I think this was very much in the acute phases of losing my sister. Mm -hmm. In March, it will be two years. It still feels acute, but I'm talking like the first six months. And on this podcast, there was a discussion about the sort of colloquial cultural catchphrases that are often said when people lose somebody like, I can't imagine. Yeah. Oh, when I lost my sister, this is what helped me. Right. And all the things, all the things that people are trying to do to show up and it falls flat on its face. And so in the podcast, whoever was being interviewed said, imagination is the bridge to empathy. And I just remember feeling so struck by that. And I, from that point till now, made it a mission to express that when and where I could as it was relevant because for me, the only thing that gives any solace at all is when I talk about loss at the mm-hmm. level I had it for someone to just try and imagine for a moment, because when people say, I can't imagine, of course they can. It's just a thing we learn to say. It's also a very clever way to guard your heart against going to that very scary place of a yeah. matter, Right. But if we did, if we imagined for a moment, the extent of someone's pain in that scenario, then the way we could respond to them, the way we could hold space for them, as you're saying, would be wildly different than the way that we do now. And very healing and very, very important. And so anytime someone says, I can't imagine, I say, can you try? Can you try? And and I, I'm just curious, you know, this whole conversation of imagining and that it requires, yeah. you know, yeah. sort of a level of like emotional bandwidth that you just maybe weren't given or whatever, but clearly you, you've learned quite a bit of that just by being a curious practitioner who does hold space for people because yeah. you get to expand your emotional bandwidth a lot just to be that person. So what does, what does that mean to you when I share that with you? I think my first instinct is just to disagree. Uh, I'm not trying to invalidate what's helping you find meaning in this experience. I just, from a technical perspective, we literally cannot imagine, right? So there's a famous researcher in psychology named Paul Bloom, right? Paul Bloom, his whole research career is mostly about empathy, right? He's got a number of books. Uh, The most famous one is probably his 2016 15, whatever book called Against Empathy. And it's a fascinating book. It's always worth a read. Um, it's it's not super technical, but it's got enough technical to it that if you are interested, you can look up the references and stuff like that. So what's come out in the literature since that book was published still kind of confirms a lot of the premises of the book. So one of the premises of the book is that um, uh, back to therapy research, right? So there is this assumption that I think a lot of people make in general, which is that like people want a therapist that's warm and fuzzy and nurturing and um, um, gentle and all these things, which, you know, on its face makes perfect sense because most people are going to therapy because they feel beat up and broken and beaten down by life and all this stuff. So, of course, you don't want some person yelling and screaming at you and calling you stupid for your feelings, obviously. However, what's fascinating is if you actually look at the research on like which type of therapist do people really prefer, it's not the high empathy therapist. In fact, people hate their high empathy therapists. And the reason they hate them is because when you see your therapist emoting and being effusive and things like that about their feelings, their reactions to what you're going through, and I can't believe and all this stuff, people actually feel more invalidated, number one. 
And number two, they feel like they have to manage the reactions of their therapist. And that is not what you're paying all that money for. And so what's interesting is, at least according to the good data we have, is that people prefer a less empathic therapist than a more empathic therapist. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to the second point uh, as, as to why I disagree about like imagining things, mm -hmm. which is it's impossible. So if you look at the research on empathy and the parts of the brain and all this stuff, which we can totally nerd out on at some point, not to distract from this conversation, it's pretty clear that all the parts of your brain involved in experiencing what we call affective empathy, where you like feel what the other person's feeling, all the parts of the brain involved in that are almost all about memory. Mm. What's interesting about that is that what that means, the, the implication of that is that when you think you're feeling what the other person's feeling, when you think you're in the shoes of the other person, from an emotional or visceral perspective, what's actually happening is you're projecting your shit onto them. So if you've had loss, if like I've had loss too, right? I lost my mentor, John. I loved him very dearly. I lost my friend, Doug, as well. So if I were to say, you know what? Sam's had this profound loss. I bet if I pull up some of the feelings that I've had, right, from a technical perspective, this is how empathy works. Pull up the feelings of loss that you've had mm -hmm. and try to relate to her from that place. So there's two consequences of doing that, both of which I think are fairly maladaptive. Number one is that now it's about your fucking feelings and not about the patients, mm -hmm. right, as a professional. Because the problem is there's no human being on the planet, myself included, when you have strong feelings, that you're present for the other person. It's impossible. Because then your feelings are too present. There's too much space in your mind and your body being taken up by your experience, mm -hmm. right? Secondarily, the other consequence of that is you're now going to view that person's loss in this case. So my loss is through my, my experiences, my culture, my upbringing. Your loss is through your lenses, right? The problem is the way our memory works is we don't know how to incorporate all the data of another person's life into your filters. It's impossible, just biologically. We don't have enough like computing hardware up here mm -hmm. to take all of Sam's memories, culture, life experience. And I don't even know you really. And so... I couldn't even possibly try to factor all of your life experiences into how you experience loss and try to like compare and contrast with mine in the 10 seconds we're having a conversation about or minute we're having a conversation about. So it's quite literally impossible to relate because it's all about how you see things or how I see things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when I think I'm relating. So it's inherently unintentionally selfish and that's the thing about i think like evolutionary neuroscience is that we are selfish creatures we have to function this way in order to survive because it's about our genes getting to the next generation and so we have these like really dumb instruments in our programming right one of them is theory of mind or empathy right but it's like a sledgehammer and it's not a scalpel because it can't be because imagine all the glucose you'd have to burn to factor in the millions and trillions of differences between each other, to have like a real accurate understanding of what the person's actually going through and how it differs from yours. It's almost nearly impossible. There's like not enough computing power on the planet to do that. You know what I mean? Does that make any sense? Oh, totally. And I think it's so fascinating and I still have a lot to say about it. So, so okay. two things. first, um, this is so good because this like really touches on, I feel like the difference between me and you. <laughs> oh my God. It's so good. I can't wait to it's talk good. about this. Um, okay. So two things. The first thing, which is a little more superficial than the second is that I've had really bad therapy and I've had really good therapy For and sure. the really good therapy I believe uh -huh. even through the lens of quote unquote empathy, because it can only be, as you said, through her lived experience. And it is literally impossible for her to know mine for sure. Even through that lens, it is with really healthy boundaries where it does not cross over because she has enough self-awareness and accountability. It does not become about her. Good. And her stuff and her feelings. It's just enough 
Yeah. So the drawbridge goes down. Yeah. I feel like I can maybe walk across it toward her. Sure. And, yeah. So, totally. so, and the reason why, to the second point I want to make, that that is important. So data is fucking wonderful. You know, I have a doctorate too. I was so excited to get out of school and be like, I am a fucking doctor. I am a doctor of physical therapy. I, it is evidence-based, you know, the way mm -hmm. I practice to the best of my ability. And then art has to mix with science here and there until we figured more shit out, right? In the research. Right. But if we both, you and I agree, and I think we do because you, you said the word connection. Mm -hmm. There's been research on this too, that we are hardwired for mm -hmm. connection. Totally. And... To say things like, I can't imagine that. I don't want to imagine that. Or, oh, when I, this happened to me or when that happened to me. That's also inherently self-centered. The less self-centered and the more connecting version is the attempt at going, huh, let me pull up from the memory bank of my experience of loss for a second not dwell there, not make it about me and my pain, but just touch it. Get those centers activated, not so much that I'm dysregulated, but enough to go, ah, uh, and say something like this to the other person. That sounds really hard because then you see me, I feel cared for, I feel heard, and I feel connected to mm -hmm. you. And that is everything. So even though empathy in itself is limited, even though the research tells us X, Y, and Z, it is the best shot I think in the hardest feelings I've ever had at connecting with someone else that we have got until science proves otherwise. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> For me, at least, the first thing you said makes perfect sense. I think that, you know, there's there's a happy medium for everyone. Everyone's built a little differently. So some people might need a little more on the happy medium side than less, whatever. Uh, the second thing you said, though, I still think I, I fairly fundamentally disagree because empathy is mostly projection. And so the problem I have with that is it's really more about us and it's less about the other person. And so my rebuttal to that would be, can we be curious and inviting as opposed to empathic and inviting? And now that's a false dichotomy because that's assuming that you have like the ability to turn off and turn on your lived experiences and your memories and shit like that, which is impossible, right? But, you know, we have the power, I guess you could call it, of like metacognition, which is to pay attention to what's happening inside and go, okay, what's really happening Am I too much of this, that, or the other, so on and so forth, right? You can you can be self-aware, right? And so in that space of self-awareness, I would push for more curiosity. And I obviously have a bias for various reasons, but I would push for curiosity as opposed to empathy. And the reasons because, specifically, if I'm curious and I try my best to be mindful about the curiosity and not pointed about it, right? Because when it's pointed, it's about me. And when it's more mindful and non-judgmental, it's just about whatever I believe I'm observing and experiencing separate from me, right? To the extent that that's possible. And so for me, I, I promote more of like the curious, non-judgmental, mindful approach than the empathic approach because it's more about the other person. And what I believe I'm being paid for is to create a space for the other person to get what they need, if that makes sense. So the less it's about me, generally speaking, the better. Not that I don't have patients that I'm more colloquial with or more funny or whatever it is, you know, I just based upon the person in front of me, but my overarching goal really is to be curious and inviting and not, um, not let my whatever my experiences are be a driving force I, I want them to be in the background as forces that i can pay attention to and i might take hints from but i don't want it to be the force that pushes me forward because i think what personally what should push me forward is principles 
What about the notion that every single thing we think and say and do is a projection when it comes to relating to other people? Isn't that literally all we can ever do? I mean, from one perspective, yes, okay. that's true. And then again, to the extent that we have metacognition, right, as a skill, as a as a, uh, a trait or whatever, I think that that is a force that acts in counter to it. And so it's like there's our automatic pilot way of being, which is projecting and projecting and using our lived experience and our memory to make sense of the world in front of us. You're right, I think. <clears throat> And I think we also have the capacity for these other forces, like, you know, doing meditation or doing yoga or, you know, taking a deep breath and just noticing what's happening inside and trying to separate the inside from the outside and all these things, right? <clears throat> and so I think that balancing in the direction of metacognition and trying to be more aware as opposed to less aware, less automatic pilot per se. But yeah, absolutely. There's a, a brilliant case to be made that everything is projection, 100%. So it's really interesting what you're saying. <laughs> if you were personally speaking for you as a clinician, as a person in relation to other humans, period, in the world, if you were to come towards somebody with empathy, that would be sort of a lower level self version of you. That would be a projected version of you coming from a place of your own lived experience that is inherently selfish. So you couldn't fully be present for the other person's experience and the higher version, the capital S self of you that's watching that program want to charge up and respond goes, wait, get curious, stay curious. Don't be pointed, be malleable and see what comes out of that person over there. When I come from that space. Is that right. Right? That's the way I'm oriented. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it's just, it's how I show up. Can you tell me how that dynamic shows up in your relationship with Ricky? Totally. So <clears throat> depending upon the day and the topic. <laughs> the night's sleep. <laughs> yeah, all those things. I think that the average conversation that he and I have I show up like that and it starts that way. And then <clears throat> when things get more contentious, it stops being that way and I become very pointed because at least in my very selfish state of mind, I believe that there's not reciprocity of openness and curiosity. There's intense selfishness. Mm -hmm. And so being very flawed, I tend to react with, very pointed, very clear insight about what I perceive to be happening, whether it be fear or anger or vengeance or whatever it is, um, and do it extremely authoritatively. Mm. So which is both good and bad. Mm -hmm. So you would say in those moments where it shifts, you're coming out of metacognition and dropping down into more of the land of automatic pilot, dysregulated nervous system space. Sometimes, sometimes I'm still fairly metacognitive and it just pisses him off because I'm not getting in the mud with him. Mm which obviously can feel invalidating because people are often looking for a reaction. Mm. And in many cases, I think that, that if I give people a reaction, it's actually rather disrespectful. Mm -hmm. I get that. I have a husband who's a lot like you. <laughs> so I get that. I get that. And um, it's so funny, right? Because the things that like bring us together, this sort of more emotionally volatile up and down and then the steady state, like that's the very reason I think why it works so well can also come to a big head when she's in the fan, of course, right? Of course. Uh, so then just to sort of loop all the way around and stay really current, like we can talk about it in terms of even, you know, still your relationship with Ricky, but the 12 steps, right? Yeah. You're an addict but you've been around them your entire life. You're around them now for your, for your career. Have you ever 
formally worked them? If not, how, if at all, do you take them into your daily life and use them? And an example, you know, is we could just pull back to what you just said, you know, in an instance between you and Ricky. And obviously this happens with my husband and I all the time, you know, dropping into autopilot, being reactive rather than responsive, and then sort of having to step aside kind of quickly run the gamut of one through 12 and stop at any point where I'm like, you need to do this inventory. You need to do this 10 step and go, you did this really well. This one, not so much. This one, ooh, we need to make an amends. This is where it came from. Speak to him from that space, be loving, apologize and try to do better, you know? And so this is like how I live. So I'm curious, um, your experience personally with the steps and how much or not you use them in your life. Yeah. Um, from my experience, uh, I, I think I try to use a lot of the principles and a lot of the mechanisms in the steps fairly frequently. And I'll speak to that in a second, but no, I've, I've never personally done them or worked them with a sponsor or anything. Um, you know, I've had my own therapy. And so that's kind of a, in some ways like a fourth and a fifth step, but and in like a six step looking at character issues and things like that. But, uh, you know, in terms of my day-to-day -day life, I'd say, especially in the last six years, I probably have put more mental effort into being cognizant of the recovery things I learned as a kid. So, you know, for instance, um, you mentioned doing a 10th step, right? And so kind of looking at your part in things and often like checking in with someone about your part in things. I'd say the last four years of my life, I have done a great deal of checking with other people, psychologist friends, recovery people, family, about like what they perceive my part in things is. Because what I've learned about myself over my life is that as perceptive as I think I am, it doesn't mean that I'm always doing the right thing. And so because I'm flawed and I'm a human, I need to make sure I keep asking people when especially contentious things happen in my life. I think if less contentious things are happening, then I probably don't need to check in quite as much. But, you know, when big things happen with Ricky and I, I probably talk to, I kid you not, eight people mm. because I think it, I need that many people, honestly. Um, and then... I ask them what they think I could have done, should have said, et cetera, differently. You know, is my perception wrong? All these things, expectations. Um, another piece of the recovery world that I try to keep very close to my mind and to my heart is the idea that um, there is nothing I need to weather alone in life. And it's insanity to live a life where you're the ultimate um, pilot mm -hmm. of things, you know? So as a principle, I try to be connected to people in such a way that, you know, I'm not in charge, you know? So I have a prayer life and I have all these things that make it so that I'm not the higher power of my universe. Um, another thing that has saved my mind a number of times in my life and on an ongoing kind of daily maintenance basis too, is the idea that most shit's not in my control. Mm -hmm. I'm very surrendered to use an AA word to the idea that almost nothing is in my control. And it's not even worth thinking about, right? I think about almost nothing. One thing that Pistol Pete and I have that are very different is he worries about all sorts of shit all day, every day. And I walk through most of my daily life not worrying about anything. I can have patients in crisis. This has been true about me for years. Patients can be actively suicidal. They can be relapsing, whatever it is. And I'm like, well, you know, it's kind of what it is. This is the normal state of affairs as people suffer. Mm -hmm. And some of that's because of the recovery kind of philosophy that was beaten into me as a kid. And some of that's because of my mindfulness practice for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. So then... I think I want to know one more thing. I mean, I want to know so many things, but in the in the context of the time we have for this conversation. Yeah. And I'll speak a little bit about my own experience um, first, which is that 
you know, the first five years of my recovery was very traditional, though I fought it to the nail, you know, kind of the hard knock. This is what it is like, shut up, sit on your hands, put, you know, take the cotton out of your mouth, stick it in your, whatever it is, right. You just shut up and you listen to what we have to say and you yeah. do what we suggest. Yeah. And then, and then I hit a new level of emotional desperation where my marriage was falling apart mm. and my husband's love for me was my higher power. And so I literally felt like I was falling through the earth when that happened. And I knew that if I drank and used, I would die because my first sponsor who had a lot of time sober relapsed and killed himself after my first year. So I was super fucking clear that I would die and also had no relationship with a higher power and wanted to mm. control everyone and everything. And it left me insane and spiritually bankrupt. So I worked with a woman at that point who was in Al-Anon and AA. Mm, double owner. We did the steps with a spotlight on my marriage. So we used the steps in a very efficient way based on the crisis at hand, which has been a game changer for me to this day. It's how I use the steps now. And when we got to the ninth step, she was like, have you ever made an amends to yourself? And I'm a self-lacerating diehard perfectionist. So the answer was absolutely not. And so then I started to be infused with some Al-Anon principles, some detached with love, some, do you really need to say that? Do you need to say it now? Do you need to say it like this? Do you need to say it at all? Mm. Now I'm in ACA. Okay. I feel like I'm just, I'm in the doctoral program of 12 steps <laughs> and I'm in a lot of therapy, right? So the layers and layers of this onion peeling back are pretty profound. So on the one hand, traditional AA in regards to helping a newcomer is very much like you give that unsolicited advice to that mm. newcomer. You tell them what the fuck is up because you just might be saving their life. Alanon comes in and says, maybe you should mind your own business. Yeah. <laughs> ACA says, oh, the reason you're giving everybody your unsolicited advice is because you're a diehard codependent and you're so afraid of abandonment that you got so good at telling everybody else how to live. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to do any of your own work because that's what kept you safe as a kid. So in the land of unsolicited advice, yeah. not just as a clinician, but in your personal life, in your relationship yeah. to Ricky, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I'm torn because I definitely see why um, given what you said about your personal journey, going through the steps again, etc. You've had this insight about like love and detachment and and i think i've had similar experiences with both ricky and prior relationships where you know i see things extremely clearly i'm like a sniper i see shit so obviously and um just because i see something doesn't mean that it's my responsibility to say something is definitely a challenge and so i tend to vacillate pretty wildly depending upon the situation so if it's about a lesser thing, my goal has been to basically say very little and just try to listen. If it's about something more substantial, career, um, with my friends, generally speaking, I don't give a whole lot of advice. I tend to just listen. Mm. With Ricky, I tend to go back and forth between uh, listening affirming and validating and giving recommendations that he can do whatever he wants with. Mm -hmm. um, being that we're both fairly disagreeable, he will often argue with the things that I say. And then six months later, when I end up being correct, it is my uh, general job of not saying I told you so. Sometimes I do. It's the pathetic part of me, but I do. And uh, <laughs> I'm not wrong. 
but being correct is not what makes my life meaningful. Like the reason my students love me, I just got an email from the Dean on Wednesday and it said, all of your six classes last semester, everybody loves you. You get such great remarks, blah, 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 blah. And they don't love me because I'm super intellectual and know a bunch of stuff. I might know a bunch of stuff, maybe, but they love me because I'm funny, believe it or not. Mm. I do everything I can to make them laugh while we're learning about this, that, or the other. And that's the thing that I've been racking my brain about how to bring to my relationship. Is how can I be funnier mm. and make it less about the correct thing to do? Mm. And uh, sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it goes horrible. <laughs> do you have an inherent feeling about why it's easier for you to do it when you're professing as a professor versus in relationship to Ricky? I think the the cheap answer is because they're students and not someone I'm in love with, but. I think the less cheap answer is, I think that as colleagues, we have a different um, a different dynamic in the sense of they have a, a, a very challenging experience ahead of them getting their doctorate degree. Mm -hmm. And so my goal is to make that as smooth and valuable as possible. And it is my belief, right or wrong, that that is not my goal in my romantic relationship. Which is a big philosophical difference from a lot of people, because a lot of people wish that their relationships were just easy. And that's not me. I think that that's silly. I think you can have fun, and you should be close, and you should love each other, and get each other's needs met. But I think the people who are desperately searching for their relationship to be easy are either cowards or idiots. Because genuinely speaking, if you love somebody, you should be able to talk about the not easy things mm -hmm. and go through not easy things together. Oh, for sure. And so for me, I don't pray to God for an easy relationship. Mm -hmm. And I have never. I pray for patience and I pray for the wisdom to do the right thing and live according to principles. So I, I think I bring a different attitude to that experience because I think I have different goals. My goal is not to make things easier between the two of us. Do you think if you had more fun and you had more laughter and you brought that funnier side of you to the relationship, it then translates into, well, then we're not really being serious and what are we really doing this for? Part because of it. I think both of those things can exist at the same time. And I think that actually makes the relationship much richer. So I just, you know, is that a limiting belief of yours, I guess? It is. It is limiting in the sense that I, I run the experiment and things do get better, but they get better temporarily. Mm -hmm. And they don't get better, like, it doesn't generalize to all aspects of the relationship. It's just a temporary coping skill is what it appears to be, because there's my side of it and then there's his side of it. And I'm not going to spend any time talking about what I believe his side of it is, but I believe that his side of it is the problem that making it funner is not gonna solve. Mm. It can help, but it's not gonna solve anything. And the, the, the difficult work that's required to solve his side of it, I, in many ways, have reached my limit mm -hmm. in terms of what I can offer. And maybe it's just a limitation, but I believe that we can totally work through anything. Mm -hmm. It's funny because, <laughs> My relationship with Ricky has really been like one giant experiment. I've shared this with him because yeah. I had a very, very painful friendship breakup, if you will, last year. Yeah. And another one, these are with women, another one a couple of years earlier, um, very different circumstances, but the aftermath of it is very much the same, except that in this most recent one, I felt like I got zapped out of a subconscious autopilot operation and I started to have the metacognition to go, you're doing this thing and you keep yeah. doing it with these certain yeah. people, you know? And the through line of those relationships has been, if I love you hard enough, maybe you won't leave. Now, I met Ricky 
before I had that realization. And I'm, I'm presenting the same way, just loving on him, you know, let's hang out every day. Let's talk, let's call, let's work out. Let's go. Like, let's just be enmeshed with one another. So I don't know where I end and where you begin. Yeah. And then I have this situation with this other friend that takes me to my knees halfway through last year. And I'm thinking to myself, well, fuck, I don't want to just end my friendship with Ricky because I'm kind of doing the exact same thing, but I, I want to reroute it. Mm. I want to see if it can stand on new legs. I want to see if I don't give myself away, if I don't try to change and fix him, if I just let him have all the ideas he has, whether they're wildly different from my principles or not. And I just hold space for it. Yeah. And we laugh when we want to laugh. We create when we want to create. We talk shop and serious shit when we want to talk shop and serious shit. What yeah. that might be like. And to my delight, not only have we continued to sort of be able to push forward and have a, a, a more sort of bustling, richer friendship, because when I set a boundary, he honors it. He's like, mm -hmm. okay, which is not my experience. I've been either too afraid to set a boundary or when I set one, the other person flips out and I go, oh, I'm so sorry. And so, and him wanting and being interested in excavating some of his shit, which was mm. completely not a part of my plan. It was not like a, I'm going to 12 step you. I'm going to show you the light. I'm going to show you the way. It was like, I kind of just want to show up as I am. And as long as you and I can keep repairing whatever little ruptures come up and we're both yeah. interested in doing that, there'll be a way forward. The oh. rest of it is not up to me. I don't want to tell you what to do. I don't want to tell you how to live. And it's this really lovely thing. And I think with my husband, and I think this is a very big delineation, work life, friend life, and romantic life, which is like, I drop into most autopilot subconscious operations with my significant other, right? Of 20 years, like all yeah. of a sudden I'm sitting here. He did not ask me for a single goddamn piece of advice. And I'm, blah, 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 you should, you should, you should, you know what I'm hearing you say, blah, blah, blah. Sam, I just need you to listen right now. I love you. I know you're trying to help, but I don't need your advice. And yeah. we have to do that all the time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's really interesting. Um, what we learn in relationship, talk about like projecting, having a mirror sort of pinned right up against you, right? Which is really what our relationships are. It's just one giant mirror going, okay, that's where I'm at right now. Fine. Some things are going great and some things need some polishing up. Noted, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the last question I want to ask you is if you have this answer, uh, is there a particular step that though you haven't worked them sort of in order formally that you pull upon in your own 24 hour day the most often? My first reaction was one. Hmm. My second reaction was 10. Mm. You know, I try to start my day with prayer. And so that prayer usually involves something like, please let me know what you think is the best thing to do. Because the implication is like, I don't know, I am powerless to, and so on and so forth, right? Now, that's not what the first step is technically about, but, you know, it's a reminder of the fact that I am powerless, not over alcohol, but over everything. Yeah, I think that is what the first step is about. Well, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so for me, that's kind of the most important thing is realizing that there's there's nothing I really have to know or do because it's really not in my hands. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know, I guess I, I just listened to this incredible podcast literally the other day and it, 
I haven't been brought to tears by a podcast in a long, long time, but I was. And I think yeah. just because it's been my experience uh, in recovery in regards to where I have found the most solace in the greatest amount of desperation, which is uh, this woman on the podcast, Elizabeth Gilbert, super famous author. She wrote Eat, Pray, Love, mm -hmm. a lot of bestsellers. She, uh, I don't think intentionally meant to do this, but started this practice that has now uh, built a community around her doing it with like 50,000 people. So it's almost like a movement mm -hmm. uh, where they bookend, they start and end their day with the question, love, what would you have me know today? And then mm -hmm. it's a two-way letter, which I found out in this podcast that Bill Wilson, it never made it into the big book. And I, I, I just find this astonishing for how mm -hmm. long I've been in, in recovery that Bill Wilson, this was his foremost practice. And the first hundred people that got and stayed sober that never relapsed. This was the practice was a two way letter to God, quote unquote, if you will ask, yeah. what would you have me know today? And the writing back, if yeah. love, if the most loving presence inside of you around you could write to you and direct your day, what would it say? Yeah. I feel like that's kind of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As far as th that prayer that you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That's generally it. Well, there you go. Then you and I share something wildly important in common, Dr. Lockwood. I believe so. <laughs> it was so great to talk to you. Likewise. Thank you so much for doing this. I have no doubt you are going to help so many people. This is such an important conversation. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I know. I feel like I know you so much more now. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure I'll see you soon. Okay. Have a great day. You too. I want to help you, but I don't know how. I want to guide you, but I can't figure it out So tell me what you need And tell me where you bleed And I will listen, I can listen Oh, I will listen you seem so stuck there, holding on to some old story, still going strong. So tell me what you did, and tell me how you lived, and I will listen, I can listen. I will listen to you Where can you go now? Can I keep you from falling down? If you just keep floating, you won't drown There's a no If you listen, can you listen? Oh, I will listen to you. There's a voice deep inside you that will be there to guide you. So tell me, what do you hear? Can you quiet? Can you listen?
you.